way, I just want to say, you know, we got out of that school of evangelism, and I was uh, talking to Larry Daniels about that the other day, and um, I, um, Larry, are you are you listening? Are you able to talk to me? I am on. Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, I'm here. I, yeah. I, I want Larry to kind of talk to everybody about this just for a second, uh, about uh, look, it's easy to kind of let things fall through the cracks. Don't do that. I hope everybody's written their testimony out. Remember how to do your testimony in three minutes or less. We talked about how to do that. I hope that you've done that in your book. Larry and them have written the group that he's involved with have been working on that. So, Larry, can you take a second and tell everybody what you've been doing? And um, uh, what, you, like we talked, you were telling me the other day. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we've. We're fortunate that we have that Zoom group. And with that Zoom group, we have an ability to encourage one another and we've all been working on our testimonies. And so the last time we had our Zoom session, uh, maybe two Thursdays back, we all did our testimonies. And that gives us a chance to critique each one and encourage each other and to make sure we get our testimonies done. Uh, we found that the biggest problem we have was um, uh, uh, separating our journey to salvation and our journey to the right division and sonship from our testimony uh -huh. and our testimony is included in our journey and we worked on that dallas and i had a had a long conversation about that and we finally get that straightened out but we were able to get it separate our testimony from our journey and so we got that done but we got practice on it and then we also did um the evangelism and i'm going to show you what i did if you can see my little book here but uh, the notes that you gave us, Brother Mike, yes, I sir. took those notes and I, I cut them down and made them so that they fit in my Bible. Uh, Dallas and Margaret sent us this Bible, and we use that uh, for evangelism, and we put our notes in here. So we've been working together in our Zoom session to make sure we get all these things up and running. We've been very helpful and continue to encourage each other and make sure we stay on point to get out ahead of this work. I'm, I'm still working on my seven steps for a, a fully educated son, shirting is done, but I'm still working on mine, but this, I'm glad for this break because this allows us time to get that done. Okay, great. Now you guys bought New Testaments, right? So you could put the yes. plan of salvation in that New Testament. Yes, I do. Yeah. I do, and not only that, I've got that, I've got the notes, if any, I'm retired, so I have time to do all these things, but I know everybody else is working. And if they don't have time, I've got these notes. I can send them to anybody who wants them. Yeah, I got, if they, if they want to email me, I'll send the notes and this Bible that they are, they're made to fit right inside of. So to help us with our evangelism. Wonderful. You want to get, do, do people know your email? I can put it on the chat right now. Please do that. That'd be great. Thank okay. you, Larry. You're welcome. Okay. I just, that's real exciting. You know, Neil and I were talking here before the break, and um, he was saying, man, I really hope folks are staying on this, but if you don't hear anything, you don't know. And then I'm talking to Larry Daniels, and he's talking about them buying those New Testaments and outlining that plan of salvation in the New Testament, writing their testimony, and all of that's really exciting uh, to hear all the stuff that was going on for that. So I wanted him to say a word about that. Thank you, Larry, for doing that. I just want everybody to be encouraged from that. Okay, this is great. So let me set this thing real quick, and then we'll get started on this second session. Actually, it is recording, but, well, as such as it is. But anyway, we'll, it's all right. We'll just figure it out. Okay, so this is session two. Um, we w went a little further. I know we went over in that first one, so we went, went a little further. We were looking at that thing in 1 Corinthians where there were some people that denied the resurrection itself. That's not what they were doing. Let me give you this next PowerPoint. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Look down at the bottom in verse 18 of that passage right there. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, they, they erred concerning the truth, but what, what did they do? I just want to pick up where we left off. They didn't deny the reality of the resurrection. They just got the timing of the resurrection wrong. Remember, when, when Paul's talking about the resurrection here, he's talking about the blessed hope. 
And that means if they think that the blessed hope has already taken place, then they're over there in Daniel's 70th week during the tribulation. And as somebody in this group so accurately said before the break, I said, what, what, you, you know, would that, where would that put them? And they said, under the law. Back, the law would be in effect again. And that's right. And if you go back to 1 Timothy, take a look with me here at the kind of problem that he was having. Look in 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned, from which some, have swer having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. Why in the world did they want to be teachers of the law? Well, look, first of all, if you think that the blessed hope has already taken place, you think you're back in Israel's program, you would want to go back to teaching the law. And I'm not saying that in, for, in, in first hand, I'm not saying that's everything that's taken place there. But let me ask you a question. Is the law biblical? Yes, the law is biblical. Is the law true? Yes, the law is true. Was there a program in connection with the law? Yes, absolutely. And that was Israel's program. But you see, but, but the problem is, that's not the dispensation that they were living in. So that was the miscalculation that they made. So they're saying, what these guys are saying back to uh, 2 Timothy, uh, uh, Hymenaeus and uh, Philetus, they were saying, look, we're not in the dispensation of grace any longer. Now we're in the kingdom program. And, of course, when we say the kingdom program, we're talking about that Daniel 70th week leading up to uh, the millennium. And so what is it that divides those two programs? Look, this is easy. This is easy. You've got the dispensation of grace moves along until the blessed hope. You're caught out. And then, you know what? Now, back in Israel's program, that's the event, the resurrection. That's the event that separates the two programs. So they were that they just moved that uh, on the timeline, and so <clears throat> that now d having said that, now those were the two things I wanted to show you about Second Timothy two fifteen, but that brings me some ob to some of the objections that I want you to be able to answer when people talk about dispensationalism and right division. Some people say, "Look, uh, I've heard pre they hear a preacher talk about a dispensation being a period of time." And then another preacher will come along and say, a dispensation is not a period of time. And so they, they hear a guy say that, and then they dismiss everything that he has to say about a dispensation because they think it doesn't have anything to do with, with time. But let me just ask you, so they just dismiss it all together. But I want to ask you here, did you read that definition that we looked at in the very beginning? Let me go back to that and give it to you. So here it is. Look with me. A religious order or system conceived as a divinely instituted or as a stage in a progressive revelation expressly adapted to the needs of a particular nation or period of time as the patriarchal, mosaic, or Jewish dispensation, the Christian, the Christian dispensation, also the age or period during which such system has prevailed. So in the Oxford English Dictionary, it actually talks about a dispensation in relation to a period of time. Now, you can argue and go, well, it's the arranging of what God is doing. It's not a period of time. No, but it takes place in a period of time. Do you understand that? When, when you're talking about the dispensation or the age of innocence, that's before the fall in the garden, there is a specific period of time in which that takes place and then there's a change and then that takes place now you say well it's it's an ordered it's a divinely ordered system okay but it happens in time you can't divorce time from it if you talk about it at all as a matter of fact let me go back to the second timothy passage and show you this look at this verse 18 look down in verse 18 who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is what? Is that a time element? Yes, it's a time element. It's past. It's a time element. So you can't get away from that when you're talking about it. Now, there's another thing uh, uh, to talk about here, 
and that is some people say I don't like to talk about dispensations I like to talk about covenants uh, covenants is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible uh, dispensation is not mentioned that very many that very many times if God deals with people he doesn't deal with them by dispensation he deals with them by covenant is that true the answer very briefly is no it's not true and let me just show you a couple of things about that first of all do you realize that as members of the church, the body of Christ, we are not under any covenant? So you can't say God deals with everybody by covenant. That's not true. We're not under a covenant. God didn't make a covenant with us. So and by, as a matter of fact, let me show you where Gentiles were all together. You know, go with me over to Ephesians 2.11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Oh, wait. In what? Time past. There's a time element. Okay, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise. You know who most of the covenants are with? With the nation of Israel. And let me just tell you that every covenant that God made with them did not change the dispensation that they were a part of. So it's, it's a fallacy to say that God only works with people through covenants and, 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 and so we shouldn't be using dispensations. First of all, we're strangers from the covenants of promise. And God doesn't make a covenant with the members of the body of Christ. And he's not dealing with us under the law. He's dealing with us by grace. And that is a dispensational change from what was taking place in Israel's program. Now, look, there's two different ways to look at your Bible right here. And I got to looking at this and I at first I took it out and then I thought, no, no, no. And someone's going to run into this. And so I need to talk about it. But then it just became so long. It really deserved a whole bare bone study on its own. Maybe one day if I get time, I can do that. But for today, I just want to point something out and let's make uh, I want to make it really short. But I, I need it to be clear every once in a while when you're talking to someone and you're talking about rightly dividing the word, or you're talking about dispensationalism, someone is going to come along who is, a, who is either a covenant theologian or they are familiar with that kind of teaching. And, and so there's basically two big ways in which you can look at the Bible. So let me put them up here for you. Covenant theology and... dispensationalism there's a couple of things that you need to know about this so let me just do this very very briefly number one almost every single covenant theologian is a Calvinist if you're a covenant theologian it's almost a guarantee that you're a Calvinist for every exception to that rule you show me, I'll show you 50 that are the rule. But when you get to dispensationalism, that does not mean that you are a Calvinist. It doesn't mean you're not, but it doesn't mean you are. That's not really the issue there. If you're a Calvinist, what does that mean? Well, let me just give this to you very briefly. You've seen this before, and I'm just going to talk about it. This one is TULIP. That's the acronym for those five core beliefs of Calvinism. First one is total depravity. And when, you, they, and when a Calvinist says total depravity, you look at it and you say, that means we don't have the power to save ourselves. We're depraved. That would be true. But a Calvinist looks at total depravity and says, you not only cannot save yourself, you cannot even exercise faith. Because they say faith is a work. And so you can't earn your salvation. So you can't do any of it. You're totally depraved. God saves you and you have absolutely nothing to do with it. The you is unmerited favor. In other words, when we think of unmerited favor we think of there's nothing about us that we intrinsically deserved uh, salvation there was anything that we by which we merited salvation 
I, I want to skip down to a couple of others, though, because these are, these are ones that I need to spend more time on. Limit, limited atonement. Limited atonement. Limited atonement says that Christ did not die for everyone. He died only for those that God elected to be saved. That's the only ones. And that if he died for anyone who did not got, get saved, that would contradict God's sovereignty. And since God is sovereign, which to a Calvinist means God controls everything. Things don't just happen with his permission. God is ordaining everything that happened. And I have a problem with that. But again, this is not, you know, a, a, a bare bone session on Calvinism. Let me move to the next one. The I is irresistible. Irresistible grace. Irresistible grace says if God has elected you to salvation, you will be saved no matter what. Um, you don't have any choice in the matter. Um, and, uh, and that is because you don't have a free will. If God picks you to be saved, you are going to be saved. You don't, you don't have a choice in it. It is irresistible. You're not going to be able to say no. You're not going to be able to thwart what God is wanting to do. The P the perseverance of the saints to a normal person they look at perseverance of the saints and they think of eternal security once saved always saved but again to a calvinist it means more than that the perseverance of the saints to a calvinist means once you get saved your life is now going to change and you're going to start living in a different way and if you do not then you are not, that is a proof that you are not saved. That's why so many Calvinist preachers struggle with their salvation. When I was pastoring in Glen Rose, we had a guy at a Emanuel Baptist Church there who was a Calvinist. He stood up one Sunday, after being there for years and years, he stood up one Sunday in front of his congregation and he said, uh, now look, he's a nice guy. I'm, I'm not saying that. He's a nice guy. But he stood up in front of his congregation and he said, I got saved this week. And so I'm going to ask one of the, I've asked one of the deacons to baptize me today. He said, if you don't want me to continue to be your pastor, I understand. But if you do, then I'll be happy to continue. Well, first of all, I think, he, I, you know what? I believe with all my heart, this man was already saved. But because of his Calvinistic theology, he no doubt took a look at his own life and thought, you know what, if I was really saved, maybe I wouldn't be thinking this way or doing this or whatever, and I must not be saved. So he got saved, and now he's going to be baptized. Well, look, you know what, if you haven't been saved, what is it about 15 years of pastoring as a lost person that you think qualifies you to now be the pastor really why not why don't we just hire really smart unsaved guys see that doesn't make any sense to me first of all if you understand the bible and you truly just got saved you need to sit down and learn some things i would think but i think the guy was saved i actually like him but um Anyway, that's the confusion that this kind of, because a guy looks at his life and he goes, I, I, I just must not be saved. But that's a scary proposition because if you realize you're not saved and now you want to be saved, the question is, how do you know you're one of the elect? See, it's a, it, 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 well, there's a whole lot of things wrong with the system. I just wanted to give you that. If you're a covenant the theologian, you are a Calvinist, and if you're a Calvinist, you understand what I've just talked about on, on that board. Every Calvinist would say, no, you oversimplified that. There's way more to it than that. Let me show you some scriptures over here. But you do understand Calvinists don't rightly divide the word. So where are they getting their scriptures? Yeah, you know. Sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Why would you go? Yeah. 
th- there are those who understand that there's a lot of commands to you know, preach the gospel, to be, you know, ambassadors for Christ, and, you know, that we've been given that word of reconciliation to publish, you know, to others. And they understand that. And so they try to be uh, consistent with it. So you say, I do witness to people. And if you say, why are you witnessing to people when, first of all, they can't even choose to be saved? And secondly, um, if, they're, if Christ didn't die for them, they couldn't be saved no matter what. And they say, and here's their answer. They're just trying to be consistent. And they say, yeah, I don't understand it, but the Lord told me to go do it, so I just go do it. Well, I I understand that, but you see there's a big gap in your understanding about what God is doing because those things don't make sense. So instead of saying, you know what, maybe I'm thinking about something wrong, they just go, yeah, I know, I don't know, I just do it. He just told me to do it, I just go do it. Well, see, as an adult son, you're supposed to not only know what to do, but you're supposed to understand why your father has you doing it. That I just go do it because I'm told to do it is a bit like a horse. The, this is what the Bible uses to describe this, a horse with a bit and a bridle. You don't need to know what we're doing. I'll just tug the rein, and you just go the direction that we're going. I think our father has a little more expectation for us as his sons and daughters than that. Okay, again, that's not a theological argument that but that answers that answers your question um so uh but dispensationalists are not always uh uh, calvinistic now covenant theologians covenant theologians believe that there are basically two covenants one is a covenant of works before the fall in the garden And the second one is a covenant of grace. And that happens from the fall forward. And here's my issue with that. In a nutshell, again, this is not meant to be a big theological exposition of covenant theology. But this terminology is not found anywhere in your Bible. There is no such thing as a covenant of works. Now, they're looking at what's happening in the garden, and they're calling it a covenant of works, but they're saying God made two great covenants. He made a covenant of works before the fall, and I'm wondering when, where, because I don't see that. The second one is he made a covenant of grace that goes from the fall onward. But the word grace doesn't even appear in your Bible until you get to Noah. Do you understand how long a period of time it is from the garden, if you take all those chrono- chronological ages and events and how long they live till they have so-and-so and how long they live, and you extrapolate that to Noah, that's 1,500 years. That's all. 1,500 years. So I'm wondering, wh- wh- where did that co- when did that covenant of grace get made? Where was that? Because I don't see that described either. I'm just being honest about that. Traditionally, dispensationalists hold to seven dispensations i'm going to put those up there i'm going to have to look at these notes because i don't really agree with every one of these but but i I understand so you have a you have a dispensation of innocence and that's in the garden of eden and so and that's before the fall and then you have a dispensation of of conscience, con- conscience, yeah, and that runs from the fall to the flood. And w- what that basically says is that men were supposed to follow their conscience, and that's how they would follow after God and be acceptable before God. The next one is the dispensation of human government, and that came into being after the flood and that continued and this is this is where the death penalty is given and so uh, after that then you have the dispensation of promise and that is going to run from um, Abraham sorry That is going to run from Abraham to Moses. And then you have the dispensation of the law. And that is going to run from Moses 
to Christ. And then you have a dispensation of grace. And that is going to be from the cross onward. And then you have a dispensation of the kingdom. I think I got it right. And uh, that, is, that is going to, uh, of course, start with the millennium. That's, that's the millennium. So is that seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? There they are. That's traditionally the way they do that. You understand, this is problematic right here because what you're saying is a dispensation of grace started at the cross and runs through. That is a misunderstanding that you're still in Israel's program in those first chapters of the book of Acts because the mystery, the dispensation of Gentile grace doesn't start until the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And so uh, there, there's some issues here with this, and you can debate that back and forth again. This is not meant to be a deal. What I'm doing is I'm showing you the two general views toward your Bible. I'm going somewhere with this, so just stick with me for a moment while I lay this groundwork. So you have covenant theology, which views the Bible as operating under these two covenants, and, uh, and almost all of those guys are Calvinistic. You have dispensationalism, which some are Calvinistic and some are not, some are Armenian. They think they can lose their salvation. So there's a whole bunch of folks that come under this banner that they basically see the, 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 the seven dispensations. I see those a little differently. I'm just showing you the standard way that that is looked at. Now, here's the other thing that I want to say to you about this, and that is that covenant, covenant theologians, this is the important thing you need to get if you get anything. They see the Bible allegorically. Uh, <clears throat> Let me give you an example of this. When a covenant theologian reads Genesis 15, let me just put it up on the screen. Look at this verse. When they read this verse, now an allegory, by the way, let me just go ahead and put this up so you'll un kind of understand. A dispensationalist sees the Bible literally. So you have one that sees the Bible allegorically. It's got a lot of symbolic, figurative, metaphorical language. You got another one that interprets the Bible more literally. That's the two main views. Now, in Genesis 15, 18, let's just read it. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and that's up north. So you've seen me draw this on the board before, but when you have, you know, this land area coming down like this, and that Nile all splits off like this, just like this. This is the river of Egypt, and then you got that land of Israel up here, and then up here, I'm not going to be able to do this to scale, but up here you've got this Euphrates, you've got the Tigris and Euphrates River, and God is actually saying all this land area right in here, that's the land grant that God gave to Abraham for the nation of Israel. But when a covenant theologian looks at that, he does not believe that God literally gave Abraham and his seed after him, his descendants, the title deed to a piece of real estate on the earth. He reads that and he goes, hmm, now what does this mean? That's why in the old days, they used to have these little sayings. I'd say, I don't care what you think it means. What does it say? Well, that doesn't mean, by the way, that dispensationalists don't understand that there is some metaphorical language in the Bible. There is. Let me give you an example of one. Revelation 9.1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, because I'm a dispensationalist, and I tend to take the Bible literally, do I think that's a real literal star that's sitting up there in the heavens that twinkles at night? The answer is no. First of all, if one of those stars fell to the earth, we would just be consumed in the flames of it. They're way bigger than the earth, and it would burn the earth up. But then you also notice that it says, and to him was given... So we recognize from the text itself that the star, it, that, that word star is a figurative now, metaphorical, so to speak, use of an angel that was given the key to the bottomless pit. 
And if you read some other scriptures, you get more detail about that, and you can fill all that in. So, yeah, I understand that there is some figurative language that's used in the Bible. And, and so when you can't take it literally, well, there you are. But I don't see everything figuratively. So let's go back to that Genesis 15, 18. So a covenant theologian, he reads Genesis 15, 18, and he does not think, I think that's the promised land that God gave to Israel. And they gave you the boundaries from the river of Egypt up to the Euphrates. Let me ask you a question. Does Israel control the, all of that land area today? Nope, they do not. But does that mean God couldn't have given it to them? See, if you don't rightly divide the word, if you don't dispensationally look at these scriptures, then you don't understand. Then you'll look at that and say, you know what? They don't control all that, so God didn't give it to them. That's what a covenant theologian would say. You guys are taking it literal. God gave it to them. How come they don't own it? There's a reason they don't own it. But you only know that when you rightly divide that word, when you understand dispensationally what God is doing with Israel. But let me just tell you that when his purpose with Israel is accomplished, how much of that land area will they own then? Every single bit of it, because you know what we, what we find out in the Scripture? Is that they don't go get all of that. Their Messiah returns and gives them all of that when the Lord Jesus sits on the throne of David and rules the world as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's when that happens. But if you don't understand dispensations, then you don't see that. So what do they think that that means? They think that Genesis 15, 18 means this. Now you're looking at the verse. Oh, no, you're not. Now you are. So you're looking at the verse. Here's what they think that means. Christianity is going to conquer the whole world. I'm just telling you, I'm just giving you the bottom line as to what they think that is. Um, <laughs> that's a covenant that God made with Abram and his seed after him. But again, we can debate all that in another study where we really have time to do that. Come back, come back now to 2 Timothy and look at this text on rightly dividing the word. And I want to drop you down to the very bottom of that. Look at verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. How does failing to rightly divide the word of truth overthrow the faith of some people well <clears throat> i started out <coughs> making mention of this at the very start of the first lesson i want to come to that true story that i said i was going to tell you there this this, this is a true story of a man he did not know about right division or dispensationalism he had just heard the bible uh, taught from the standpoint as the whole bible is for you and you all to practice it if you're going to you know really please god and so he's reading in his Bible, and so he reads this in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 21. Jesus said to him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and uh, thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So you know what this guy did? He saw that, and he said, I really want to serve God, and I really want to do the right thing. So he sold everything they had that was theirs, and gave the money to the poor even down to the rug in the living room. Now you say, did he sell his house? He did not. You know, sorry, I'm off camera. So he did not, and here's why. His mother-in-law owned the apartment they were living in, so it wasn't his to sell. But everything they owned, he sold it. They had nothing. They had no furniture. They had nothing. Then he read this in Matthew 6. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? 
And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory, hmm, I'm missing part of that verse, aren't I? Let me see if it's in my notes. Was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you who was not arrayed like one of these? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth they have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the next thing he did is, I don't need to worry about all of that. God's going to take care of it. I'm going to follow Jesus. So he quit his job. So now he's given away everything they owned. They sold it. They gave the money to the poor. He's quit his job. And now he and his family, his wife and children, are living. The only reason they have a roof over their head is because his wife's mother owns the apartment. And guess what happens after about 90 days? He finds, oh, okay, you know what? So all of those are pretty good answers. Richard goes his wife divorced him. <laughs> Rachel says she kicked him out. <laughs> the mother-in-law kicked him out. I don't know about any of those, but here's why I know. After three months, he said, this isn't working. This is not working. So you know what he decided? Christianity doesn't work. So he walked away from all of it. Then one day, somebody is talking to him about the Lord, and he goes, hey, I don't want to hear that. I tried that Christianity stuff. It doesn't work. And he told him the story that I just told you. And the guy said, hey, I can explain that for you. And he showed him rightly dividing the word and the light came on. The guy understood, oh, I'm trying to obey something that is in a different dispensation than the dispensation I'm living in. If he'd have known that up front, wouldn't that have been better? Yeah, absolutely. But what's my, so here, here's, here's my point of all that. Failing to do that shipwrecked his faith. He walked away from all of it. It, it doesn't need to be that severe. L let me just say that there are plenty of people that because they don't rightly divide the word, they don't understand the things that is going on. And so they get angry and bitter with God. Why did God allow this? Why did God allow that? Why is he doing this to me? And people get angry and bitter toward God. That's, that's overthrowing the faith of some. And uh, that's how important it is to rightly divide the word. Um, so let me bring sonship into this for a moment. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes people look at things that we understand. When you first understand right division... It's very exciting and you want to tell people about it when you first understand sonship It's very exciting. You want to tell people about it But people look at that sometimes and they think that what you're doing is you're practicing some kind of elitism like you, you It's you've got something they don't have and and uh, or you're, you're too proud about it or too haughty about it or too lifted up about it and so I just want to say look these things are exciting to hear about and while I do think we need to have humility about that and be thankful that we know, at the same time, I don't think you need to apologize for being excited about finding out about these great truths that allow you to understand your Bible and live for God. Sometimes I think people kind of hide behind that because they're just criticizing right division or dispensationalism. And so as a result of that, what they do is they find other ways to be able to do that. Some people come along and they say, hey, you guys that are dispensational, well, you know what? Not until the 1800s, a guy named John Nelson Darby came along, and he's the one that started all of that. Oh, is he? 
Let me tell you what John Nelson Darby did. He did write about the rapture. He did write about uh, the, uh, the premillennial coming of the Lord to catch out the body of Christ. He did. And he did write about dispensations. And he used the word dispensation a lot. But you know what? Here's the thing. All he did was encapsulate a whole teaching into a single word. Is the word dispensation used in your Bible? I've already shown you three places that it was. But you know what's really funny to me? Is the people who criticize him for using that word dispensation in his teaching, all he did is take a word of the day and use it to encapsulate this whole train of thought. What these folks do is they come along and they use this word, rapture. Guess how many times that's in your Bible? Zero. Wait a minute. I don't, if you want to use the word rapture, I'm not, I'm not trying to get semantically technical on you. You want to do that, I understand what you're talking about, fine. I'm, I'm not trying to make a rule that you can't use that. But you know what you did? You took a whole understanding of a doctrine and you encapsulated it in one word. And all you have to do is say, we're waiting for the rapture and everybody knows what you're talking about. That's exactly what John Darby did. He took a theological understanding and he encapsulated it in the word dispensation. The only difference is his word is in the Bible and the other word is not. But yet there's something wrong with Darby, but not with you. And by the way, that didn't start in the 1800s. May I say to you that your King James translators used that word in 1611. Yeah. I went back in the Oxford English Dictionary and I thought, what is the, because when they do the, the definition of a word, they show you when the word was in use at that time with what definition. You know what the earliest definition I could find for the word was in English? 1300s. So it's been around for a long time. So someone says, yeah, but, but who, re <laughs> I was thinking about this. I was talking one time with someone, I was explaining to them about sonship. And they said this to me. They said, well, other than you, who else believes this? And I went, the Apostle Paul. And they went, yeah, okay, but I mean, who, do, who that we know today? And I thought, wait a minute. Paul's not good enough? Who do you want? Chuck Swindoll? Like that's a step up from Paul the Apostle who wrote 13 inspired books in the Bible? Really? That's not good enough? They, they, you know what? They wanted somebody for sure. I'm just looking and I'm thinking, look, you know what? Who else other than that? You don't need to concern yourself with who else. You need to look at what the Bible says. I, I, this is not about voting. Let's take a vote and see how many people think it's this way. Because people have an idea that, you know what, if it's not mainstream, then it must not be right. You do understand that when you look at church history, it's a very lopsided view. Do you know why? Because for over a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church also had the power of government. Everything got written from that point of view. And if you differed from that, you were a heretic. And that was the major view of the day. Did that make it right? Nope. Well, that hasn't changed. So we can't start going down that road. Uh, and that's the other thing I was going to say. The other criticism is that main, d dispensationalism is not mainstream. Too, too many people you know, are not dispensationalists. And I, look, I, I, I understand, but this is something that the Bible talks about, and I think it deserves uh, uh, for someone to look at that. Because when people understand right division, all of a sudden things they never understood about the Bible become very clear. So a couple of other verses to show you here. I want to show you the change. And so here we are. Let's look in Acts chapter 3 and verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ 
which before was preached unto you. This is Peter preaching, by the way, over there. In the early part of the book of Acts, this is Peter. And talking about what God is going to do. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So Peter is saying, those prophets since the world began, have been preaching to you about Jesus Christ. Now, who is he talking to? He's talking to the nation of Israel, right? Now, that's Peter, and that's what we call the prophetic program because it's been prophesied. It's been spoken all along. Now, take a look with me at Romans 16, 25. Now, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel... And the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the prophets? No. According to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. One of these dispensations was talked about since the world began. The other one was kept secret since the world began. When God interrupted the one that had been talked about, he brings in the one that was not known. Folks, that is a dispensational change. And that's the issue that I'm making to you now. And so when you <coughs> have a chance to talk to someone about dispensationalism and right division, you don't need to be afraid of that. You, you don't need to look at that and go, well, I really don't. You know what? On this one, I set the time and didn't turn it on. I can't get it right. I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. So don't be afraid to talk about these things. These are the things that cause our Bible to make sense. These are the things that cause us to be able to understand what God is and is not doing. So thank you for letting me take um, uh, uh, today to talk about these things. And um, next week, we'll, go, we'll get back on track uh, in Romans 12. Okay, so Richard is talking about, I thought you were going to talk about the Roman Catholic Church and how if you didn't agree with them that you got uh, outcast and put to death. And they did that. But you know what? They didn't only kill the kill the objectors they burned their writings so that nobody could come along behind them and find something that objected to that yeah that that's what happens when church and government do this under men it's always bad for bible believers always bad for bible believers because now they have the power of the state to execute people and control them and they're the ones that are disseminating the doctrine. But, you know, there's always been people, though, that are outliers in that. Yeah, that right. Whoever's in power. Right. There you go. Well, listen, thank you all for this. Let's have a word of prayer, and, and we'll be done today. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we love your word. It's our desire to live by that and to be sons and daughters that... Uh, can reflect your great grace and uh, lord thank you as we study through um, your word that it can effectually work in us it can give us confidence about those things and reinforce the things that we know to be true and it can also lord cause that doctrine to work in our soul and transform us conforming us to the image of your son and we desire for that to happen more than anything and i thank you so much for all these folks that join us on zoom that are part of this assembly and, Lord, we look forward to what you're going to be doing in the days ahead, especially as we get more folks that are going to be joining us, Lord. We're excited about that. And we look forward to spreading this message of the mystery to as many people as possible. In Christ's name, amen.